Hi friends. So I saw a an image uh, the other day online and uh, I'll just show you it quickly. It said the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. And it's an African proverb. When I heard that, um, it really resonated with me because it's something that you see over and over again today. Um, see it in countries that are affected by Western imperialism and war, um, where you have people joining various uh, groups because they're so fed up of their country being destroyed by Western imperialism. And after a while, they seem they lose all their humanity and they're, they're looking for some connection because their country or their communities have been destroyed and they're so angry about Western imperialism and occupation, occupation of their country. And so they're desperate and they're, 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 they're tired of their religion, if indeed they have a religion or whether they just think that they're following a religion, which is unfortunately Wahhabism is a distortion of Islam. And so there are people who follow that. Uh, they barely know anything about the Quran. But anyway, whether they know, whether they've, whatever they're doing, they're looking for some connection. And, um, I think about this often because I, you know, we, and, you know, there are lots of examples of people who've lost their connection. There's also examples of, um, you know, there are a lot of men who don't know how to be because they, they're told that they, uh, there's, there's these mixed messages, the same with women. There's mixed messages about um, being, being tough still and not being able to show emotion and so forth. And then they seek out, uh, and depending on what community, community or country they belong to, they seek out some meaning in groups. And even if that means they seek out meaning in, say, white supremacist groups, which fit into their belief system, uh, or that they want to blame a certain group for their, and that often it's punching down on minority groups, they want to blame certain groups for. Instead of looking to, um, you know, the power structures and the governments and the politicians who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is basically serving the public, so they, instead of um, looking to those as the culprits, they um, turn on uh, people that are vulnerable. This happens all over the place. You know, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Now, I'm not making excuses for uh, men who do this, or I'm not making excuses for anybody who is perpetrating violence against different uh, groups, um, but but there is a lot of displacement today with people no matter and i'm not even just i'm not just talking about men i'm talking about and i'm not talking about victims of western imperialism um i'm just talking in general because of um you know capitalism will always be a problem because it's always going to be exploitative that's the nature of capitalism and neoliberalism is always going to be a problem and uh, we've all been, you know, communities have been, been atomized due to neoliberalism. Um, there's, you know, social media, even though it's brought people together, has also um, taken people apart where people tend to focus on certain interests and they forget about everything else. And the mainstream media, um, if you've read or see, sorry, if you've seen that um, recent On Contact with Chris Hedges where he interviews Matt Taibbi, who talks about how the mainstream media, if he takes it further uh, than Noam Chomsky talking about manufacturing of consent, and he um, he talks about how they've made it almost like a worldwide wrestling match where there's the baddie and the goodie, but they select who is the baddie, like if it's somebody who's been, uh, somebody who is, say, a communist or socialist, uh, but they've been uh, sort of injured or killed or whatever, they don't show any interest in that because that goes against their business model. And if they're, um, you know, but, but they might show interest in someone who was killed that is part of their tribe, so to speak, or, or part of the system, you know, capitalist system or the imperialist system. And, and here's, um, here's Alia. She likes to come in and visit. 
Um, so, uh, so you know, that's that's the um, that's the thing. You know, the mainstream media now it's been setting up people that you should hate. Oops. <laughs> the mainstream media has been setting up people that you should hate, and um, you know, deciding who who we should hate, which is usually vulnerable groups, and uh, and hero, you know, sort of uh, hel- holds up in a sort of a pedestal those that should not be held up on a pedestal. That's you know, sort of imperialist warmongers and uh, and all that kind of thing. So you know, it's it's sort of like, and it's actually ended up with people being only hearing the opinions that are um, sort of their own of of something that that doesn't challenge them. So he was talking about that, and of course that reinforces this um, this separation of all of us really, and that instead of looking looking at the power structures and the structural racism and all of that and heterosexism and all of that, we start, um, a lot of us start turning on one another. You know how it is when you, you know, when one can feel irritated. Sometimes you can take it out on somebody that has nothing to do with that, with your irritation. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do when they when they feel like they're being trapped by the system where they're poor or, or they're black or they're living in a situation that is they cannot get out of, which is what a lot of neoliberalism has brought us now. Extreme poverty and inequality and capitalism, of course, has brought extreme inequality um, and imperialism because it's inextricably linked with uh, capitalism, imperialism is. Um, so when you get um, people who, when you get the, um, a, a lot of people who are feeling disaffected and they'll turn on, They'll turn on instead of turning instead of turning to the the, the uh, structures of power and the state. They end up turning on one another. Um, anyway, this is the sort of this is what we have now, and um, and it's only going to get worse from now on until we probably uh, and I, I believe until we have some sort of a socialist society um, because capitalism just doesn't work. So. Um, and and it's just it's it's an ecocide happening right now. So um, and I when I was watching, <laughs> she's looking for something to to do. When I was watching, um, I was watching Russell Brand. Uh, he's uh, a comedian, also a writer, um, social activist. I, I guess you could call him. And he was uh, talking about. He has a YouTube channel, and he was talking about how. Um, he was talking about anxiety and fear, and something he said, uh, which I'll share with you. Before I actually talk about what he says, um, I, I must say that um, you know it doesn't always when when with with the way the world is, and how many disenfranchised people there are, and so forth. We don't always have to end up turning on um, the m- more vulnerable of us. Uh, you know, for example, in in Venezuela, with all the crippling U.S. sanctions that are happening. Venezuelans are actually, you know, because they want to keep the Bolivarian revolution going, they all turn to one another to support one another. And that would be something that would be a great outcome for the, these, the more oppressive things that are happening today, if we all turn to one another instead of turning away from one another and trying to uh, blame um, people around us. And that's where um, learning about MMT comes in too, because... Um, uh, I'm not going to go into why that is, but you should check that out because um, that if you have an understanding of a sovereign economy, that will really benefit you and also reduce some of this blaming groups for taking away your money, uh, you know, via taxes and all this sort of thing. This myth that federal taxes fund spending and, and that somehow people and that somehow people, uh, other groups that are disenfranchised are taking away our money or something, that sort of thing. So I'm not going to go into that, but just look for the hashtag learn MMT and check that out. So, um, but you know, the Venezuelans are all banding together and this can be a good outcome for extreme, this extreme sort of inverted totalitarianism really that's happening in the United States and which is starting to happen around the world. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with that term, inverted totalitarianism, she's determined to come in here and, and get my attention. So if you see the camera shaking, you know that Alia is here trying to get my attention. Anyway, so inverted totalitarianism was a word, a term invented by um, Shellen Walden, Shellen Wallen, um, and it's 
in, is, it says it's, it's different from classical forms of totalitarianism. It does not find its expression in a dangerous or charismatic leader, but in the faceless an anonymity of the corporate state. Our inverted totalitarian pays outward fealty to the facade of electoral politics, the constitution, civil liberties, freedom of the press, the independence of the judiciary, and the iconography, traditions, and language of American patriotism. But it has effectively seized all the mechanisms of power to render the citizen Im impotent. Um, and that's true, because as you, you can see from... Oh, I haven't forgotten about talking about Russell Brand and his video, Fear and Anxiety. This is all related. But, um, you know, this is the sort of thing that we have going now, inverted totalitarianism in the United States. Um, gives all the impressions of sort of democracy and all of that, and that we have some sort of power. But in fact, it's really the, its own, you know, the, the state is owned really by and directed by corporations. Um, and that's happening slowly in Australia. And now that we once again have a, a right-wing government, Scott Morrison here in Australia, that's only going to get worse. So this is sort of like going to just uh, accelerate, the, and and eventually we'll all all sort of countries will you know probably have this inverted totalitarianism. So um, you know th this is why um, you know we have to turn to one another and support one another. And this sort of punching, this kind of um, dissing identity politics, which that when presented, this idea of identity politics is exploited by, um, you know, institutions like the Democratic Party, who exploit it so that they can use different people as bait, like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Kamala Harris, people, different pe women of color and all this kind of thing. They exploit identity politics. It's not really identity politics, and everybody who uh, anybody who is in a minority group has every right to organize and it's very important to do so. So, you know, when you hear people sort of um, blaming identity politics for the reason the left is, you know, the left, the real left is kind of in a mess, that's not really fair because um, identity politics in itself is actually fine as long as those that are promoting a certain certain rights for a certain group, also recognize the struggles of other groups and realize that it is a class struggle, ultimately. It's a class struggle and that we, we, you know, we can't get lost in our own um, sort of our own minority groups and thinking that uh, and, and not, not being aware of what the, of the, the greater issue, which is cl a class struggle. Um, and that's where I would critique, that was where I would criti criticize identity politics in that I've seen it myself, you know, with certain groups who are totally focused on their own thing and they cannot, uh, and they don't sort of acknowledge other, other people's struggles very much, if at all. So that's, that's a problem. But, you know, um, I just thought I'd throw that in there because I've noticed that a lot of people and people who would consider themselves on the left are, are blaming identity politics, even though what is presented to us as identity politics by the Democratic Party in the U.S. is really just an exploitation of that. It's completely shallow and false. Um, and it's really just using different groups as bait to bring people into that awful party, that awful warmongering corporate-owned party. So anyway, I'm digressing. So I'll go back to um, Russell Brand and this video I saw of him, which is related to that image I showed you in the beginning. Um, he was talking about fear and anxiety. At the end of the video, he said, I would say that many of the problems we have today is from having lost contact with the indigenous and native way in which we are supposed to live, in communities with one another, with tribal connections to one another, with purpose and meaning, which would once have been derived from our requirements to survive, now happily removed or at least reappropriated in the need to work, need to earn money, indirect uh, obligation to duties rather than to forage, hunt, gather, etc. And remember, I'm vegan, so I'm not talking about hunting animals or anything. This is more about the idea of, you know, community and being in communities. Um, so uh, rather than to forage, hunt, gather, etc., that our bodies and minds were cultivated in and conceived in, created in. So I suppose the spiritual solution must be to do as best we can to recreate our native traditions, I don't think he's actually meaning literally creating native traditions, through gratitude, service, connections to others. 
I hope that's the answer because I don't want to live my life in continual anxiety looking for temporary solutions. So I hope that's true. So that's Russell Brand in that uh, in his uh, video about anxiety and fear. And and I, I've often thought that, and um, I've had numerous discussions over the years about this, the the lack the lack of community, like even here where I live, rurally, you know, where where we are in some ways cut off from like-minded people in that, you know, that we don't really, well, firstly, we don't really know who our neighbours are except for maybe really close neighbours nearby and uh, and some we have things in common with and others not so much. But we have, we all c communicate with each other when there's times like the bushfires in the beginning of the year, which were very scary. And if you followed my channel, you know what I mean by that. Uh, so, you know, that's the sort of thing that people would have done in the in the old days, you know, um, when they didn't have TV and re even radio or any sort of communication. They had to kind of keep in contact with each other and support one another. And if the, if there was a some sort of disaster that happened, everybody would band together because it's in the it's in the best interest of the community. And, you know, you get to trust one another, even if you don't really have that much in common with each other. You, you get to trust each other because you've been in one another's faces. You know what it's like when people are working in the same sort of uh, organization and they get they come in in the morning and they see each other every day. And even though you may not have much in common with those people, you get to kind of trust them because after many months of seeing each other every day, just being in these uh, in these spaces with each other, I mean, we're just animals. You get to you get to know people and you get to trust people in one way or another or not trust people. You sort of you ha you know it's this uh, this phys being in the physical space, which is what a lot of us don't have anymore. Um, and the only time I probably experience sort of community is. Uh, you know, we, we try and, where we are, we try and um, sort of cultivate a sort of nice feelings towards neighbours and vice versa, you know, by sort of offering to do stuff. You know, if we go down to pick up something from town or or if something wrong happens, you know, if, it, or if somebody goes away and, and they need somebody to check out and look after their place, you know, check keep an eye on it. Or in cases like the fires, you know, where we were all... We didn't have to literally go across to our neighbours and talk to them because we had SMS, you know, we had we could text each other, but we were basically keeping in contact of if there was going to be embers starting to come across the river and um, start, you know, real problems over on our side of the river because there was really serious fires in Tasmania this year, in the beginning of this year. So we were able to do that. And that's sort of something that has been kind of lost um, you know, is this sort of people don't really know in many ways who they're living next to anymore and they don't really, they don't really entirely trust anybody because they've never really been in physical spaces with them and seen them often. And that can be, of course, just because people are constantly, tra you know, in tra there's uh, this um, impermanence of people living in areas because of neoliberalism. People keep having to change jobs or find some sort of job or, um, you know, it's and it's kind of in some ways destroyed community. Um, uh, I could go into that more, but um, that's all I'll say about that. But it's like so we don't really have those connections with people anymore, and we don't really even know who we're living next door to most of the time. Particularly if you live in urban areas and you live in a building, people are finding community now on online and have been for some time, and so they're all grouping together in these virtual communities, but they're not really the same you know it's not really the same being in a virtual community because they're really just usernames on a board or usernames on a page or a group and you don't have that important sort of physical interaction and seeing people's expressions and their behaviors and that's why there's a lot of the well one of the reasons uh, there's a lot of rudeness online is because people don't there's no accountability accountability and uh, people can just be, you know, anonymous users, basically. Anyway, there's a lot of people looking for connection online, and I have to say that um, because we don't have as much like-minded people, say, in our area, you know, we also um, derive a sort of support in a way just by being a part of, say, people who are on the left who want to uh, end wars and, you know, want to end imperialism and want to you know end social inequality and all that kind of thing we you know i i find sort of support 
online just by not literally, not literally talking to people, but just the fact that they have those same sort of um, attitudes and same sort of values. Um, but, you know, that's not the same in some ways. It's very important to me, of course, but it's not the same as, say, physically having some friend or friends. You know, I have I have a few friends that are sort of like that, but I don't see them very much because they live in another part of, you know, uh, they live, uh, you know, a couple of hours away or whatever, an hour and a half away, so I don't get to see them so much. But we all need to have some sort of community in a way. And that's why so many people are looking to communities online, because that's in some ways been lost. Um, and that's that's really bad in some ways. It's, and but, but, of course, the online is, is really great for realizing there's a lot of people who have felt really isolated in the way they are, for example, say trans people have been able to connect online. They felt like they were the only person who was trans in their area or something or in their state. And then they meet other people who have, you know, who have stories to tell about that and have experiences of the same kind, all that kind of thing. So online is very, is very important as well. But nothing in some ways beats the sort of like a physical community. I really feel like that. And I really agree with Russell Brand in that, um, and, you know, as he said, service is a really important thing. You know, like uh, that saying, if you want to be happy, you know, um, benefit others. You know, if, if you sort of, uh, if we're always just sort of thinking about ourselves and how how unhappy we are and how we don't have this and don't have that, if we're not grateful for what we have, then uh, we, um, you know, we become discontented. And But if we're grateful for what we have, even if it's, uh, even if it's not much, if we're, if we're grateful for what we have and if we try and be of service to others and benefit others, then that certainly makes can make one happier. And it also creates a trust and all of that. So, you know, that's a really, really important thing. Um, anyway, but you can tell by the number of suicides that are happening in the world how many people, and there's many. I mean, I think every every eight minutes or something, somebody kills themselves or every ten minutes in the world, someone kills themselves. Um and there's all sorts of reasons for that, of course, but, you know, I really think that part of it is just not feeling like they belong, not feeling like they are connected to anybody and feeling isolated. And also, you know, poverty and um, and feeling victimized and all of that kind of thing leads to that. And, you know, so this the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Um, even the people who are in power... Um, you know, I can't say that anybody who is happy oppressing, like, for example, Rupert, Rupert Murdoch, who seems to take delight in sort of putting his foot on the throats of unemployed people or or different uh, ethnic groups or Muslims or whatever, I can't say that anybody who really is like that is in any way truly happy. They might think they're happy and they might take great delight in doing that in some ways, but inside, how happy can you be if that's how you... Uh, if that's how you sort of derive some sort of feeling of satisfaction, to feeling satisfaction at the expense of others, at um, the victimization of others. So, you know, um, I don't know how people like that became that way. I think actually having power over time robs people of their empathy. Um, you know, that, that saying absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, I think that that's in some ways true. And I think that um, a lot of these people in power, they eventually, it's just, just too easy to affect the lives of many, many people. And I think if, after a while, they don't see um, the, they don't see people, everyday people, as, as real people. They see them as just statistics and consumers, and they don't see them that way. And I think in some ways, some people who have this sort of um, a, um, a bit of a, a psychopathic or sociopathic, whatever it is, bent end up sort of like uh well, they end up going for those positions of power and then ending up um, exploiting and harming other people so um but you know that and so that's that's another example of you know um i don't know they that they they're incapable of uh of empathy incapable of um of uh, empathy towards others and then you know so they end up you know uh they end up persecuting People. There's all kinds of, I think, examples of, you know, um, those who uh, are not embraced. I don't know. That, that's probably not the best example, but I think there's a lot of examples of that um, 
African proverb today in the world. And there's all sorts of ways that we burn burn it down to feel feel its warmth uh, when we feel isolated or rejected and so forth. Um, growing up in a certain minority group, I understand uh, also you know the isolation of that being. I, I wouldn't. I don't really like to label myself particularly much, but I guess you you would say that I was uh, same-sex attracted, um, and still am, of course. But it's like um, I grew up in the '60s, and it was really not even mentioned then. But I knew I knew at a certain point not to ever mention it, not to talk about it, not to act on any sort of feelings towards other people of the same sex, and uh, and you know that's a sort of an isolation that happens. And, um, you know, not that I felt like I wanted to start um, attacking other groups or, you know, sort of, uh, but it's like with some people, you know, if they're, if they're vilified, if they're rejected, if they're bullied and, and, you know, I've been, I haven't, I wasn't necessarily bullied at school because I wasn't really out at school because it wasn't safe. I knew that there was something, there must have been something wrong with it, even though I actually didn't feel there's anything wrong with me, but I knew that there must be something wrong with it because, it nobody seemed to be uh, like me or talking about it. Or and eventually, when I got to be in my teens, I realized that that wasn't. There was something. There must be something wrong with it. Um, and that's the thing. When you know, if you're in minority groups, um, you can. Um, the that's that's a sort of an isolation, and so you gravitate initially to groups that are like you, to people that are like you, to feel support and not feel alone. Um, People don't always have that in the countries that they live in because some are extremely homophobic or uh, whatever. They're, they're heterosexist ex to the extreme, and so that isn't always availed. It wasn't so bad in Australia, but it wasn't good. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of ways that people are excluded. And um, um, like an example of, um, say, the you know, the Columbine massacre in the late 90s, um, there was a transcript of one of the one of the people who one of the boys who was killing people the killing students in the Columbine massacre. He said to this um, uh, one of these kind of you know jocks I guess you could call them you know sports sort of sport kind of guys who had actually been persecuting this the shooter you know persecuting the guy who was killing people at school. He turned to that guy. And pointed the gun at him, and he said, "You know that you used to call me a faggot, and all this kind of thing." And he was, you know, basically, even in that moment of all this sort of where he, they were murdering children, murdering students, students that really had nothing to do with with uh, their um, persecution, you know, him feeling isolated or whatever. I'm sorry, I've forgotten this guy, the shooter's name, the guy who was doing the shooting. It doesn't really matter, but um, you know, the, a lot of a lot of the students that he killed were had nothing to do with his isolation or his persecution. This particular, you know, jock who you know they used to wear um, those baseball caps around, apparently. So they were actually wanting to kill those people first, and nobody stood up. They said, you know, everybody who's, um, um, you know, with the everybody, uh, I forget. They asked, um, they asked everybody in the cafeteria the ones that were these sports guys, you know, to sort of stand up, and they didn't stand up. So then they sort of said, okay, well, we'll just, and you know, basically decided to sort of kill everybody. Um, and these were the guys, the, the sports guys, the jocks, who were the ones that were sort of um, persecuting the, them at school, or at least one of them at school. And so that's when he said to that guy, and he didn't end up shooting that guy who was actually had been calling him faggot and everything. He left him alive. He didn't shoot him which is a very interesting thing, and I'm not sure why maybe he decided that was the abs he had the absolute power at that point and that he was choosing, he was going to let that guy remember that he had the power to kill him and he didn't at that time. It was a, it's a very odd thing. So, uh, but, you know, that's, that's an example of uh, somebody who was, uh, people didn't notice that he, how, or didn't act on it enough or didn't act on it at all, and uh, he ended up, um, you know, it ended up in a tragedy of killing a whole lot of innocent people. So anyway, there's a lot of people that are 
disaffected today and it's only going to get worse. There's a lot of people feeling isolated and that's only going to get worse unless we start, um, you know, sort of uh, trying to build communities and stuff. And that's what Russell Brown was saying and I've been thinking about that for a while. Um, with And I, we try to sort of build some kind of community where we are in this rural area, which I think we have in some ways. And also um, there's a cafe nearby where there's two gay guys who own the cafe. They're married and they try to build community in that cafe. There are sort of all these different ways, and, and they have. It's a really great community down at this DS Cafe. And uh, there's all sorts of ways that we can build community. It doesn't have to be around certain interests necessarily, but just sort of where we show care and love to others so that people don't feel isolated and they don't feel like, um, you know, that that's so important, particularly in this day and age where we're heading towards this sort of inver inverted totalitarianism or the lords and serfs sort of a situation. And um, before capitalism falls in a heap, if ever it does, um, it's going to only get worse and worse. And so, you know, that's something that we have to try and avoid is people just feeling so isolated that they kill themselves or so isolated that they want to kill other people, which unfortunately in a patriarchal society, a lot of men, particularly white men, young white men, um, tend to, to go that way and, or they kill their whole families or they kill their partners. You know, there's something that's for another, that's for another video, but that's a whole other sort of really unfortunate thing, uh, that, you know, patriarchy has brought us. I don't know if I did a very job, a very good job at uh, sort of, sort of pulling that together. But I, 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 I just when I saw that image, I just thought, God, that's so sad. It, it just resonates with me. You see it time and time again. Um, people joining groups that it's not so good that they're in those groups, and and there's violence associated with it, and then taking out that violence, punching down on on minority groups and all that kind of thing, the sort of, um, it's a kind of uh, looking for meaning in things that aren't so good and looking for, for um, you know, kinship because they don't know where to go and so they end up getting together with in toxic situations and why do they seek out these toxic situations where there's violence and where there's attacking of other groups like these white supremacist, um, white nationalist groups? Um, there's various explanations for that, but I mean, at a really base level, there's, there are, there are people looking for a group that, where they have, they feel like they're a part of that group. I mean, it's really sad that it's that kind of group and that it's, you know, that there's sort of these values of racist things and racism and homophobia and transphobia and all of that. Um, but still, it's something that they feel a part of. And But we have to provide, well, firstly, we have to encourage children to empath be empathetic with one another and be sensitive and not see that as some threatening thing that, oh, no, you're trying to turn boys into girls and all that nonsense. Empathy and care and love is a, is a human thing. It's not a gendered thing. It's not, it's not a male, female, this BS of masculinity and femininity, which are just sort of constructs. We have to encourage children to care about others. And that includes non-human animals by being vegan, stop persecuting the vulnerable. And when we, when we absolutely don't need to, these are all things that we can start doing and stop playing into these ridiculous gendered things that boys are tough and they have to show no emotion and yada yada and elevating that in some ways is oh he's so he's so strong because he do, doesn't he, he doesn't show any emotion he doesn't really um he's not fearful and all this nonsense all that kind of thing we have to get beyond that and start being a society that is that values human qualities and you know com, you know sort of care and compassion and justice and equality and all of that and then maybe we might have a chance, and even if we are going to go extinct through this climate in crisis that's happening now, at least by by that stage we can be something better than what we have been in the past. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so thanks so much for watching. Please click the subscribe button if you like the content, and please click the notifications bell if you want to see received up updates. 
and um, click the like button if you like the content and please leave comments. I always enjoy your comments. And thank you so much for your support and thanks so much for watching. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Paint Signals from Vega. Till next time. Bye for now.